I love open source. Um, and I, I think, yeah, we wouldn't be where we are now without the open source, right? So we mentioned things like PyTorch and, and so mm -hmm. Linux and things like that. Um, so, so for a company, it's always a bit tricky because especially in our case, when you have all of this core IP that you're developing, if you open source that, you give it to everybody else. Um, so I think the approach we're taking is that we'll um, open source a lot of our baselines and things like that to make sure that people see what's possible. But then if they want to have the real deal, then they would still uh, come to us. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think open source, in the language model space more generally is uh it's so right now we're at a very interesting moment and and a lot of that comes from uh fair open sourcing the llama model and then there were all these like vicuñas and guanacos and all of the other alpacas so kind of getting into it uh i i know that you're sort of you have this background from you know facebook and hugging face and now you're doing your own startup in contextual and I'd love to kind of rewind a little bit back and learn about kind of what what drew you to Facebook and what was the Facebook research culture like? Yeah, Facebook was an amazing place. Uh, so I, I joined FAIR in New York. I did my PhD in Cambridge before, um, and it was still very small, uh, lots of brilliant people, Jan LeCun, Leon Botu, Jason West, and Thomas Mikhailov, all of these legends of the field. So it was actually a very easy choice. I had interned with Leon before and they just asked me if I wanted to join. And I was like, hell yeah, uh, uh -huh. this is like the opportunity of a lifetime. And um, so, so especially in the, the first couple of years, it was just really um, like a vibrant intellectual community. It's, um, it's very academic. Uh, and I think over the years that's been changing a little bit, but, it, but it's really, I think one of the most uh, academic labs out there. And, and Jan uh, spent a lot of time at Bell Labs, one of the original innovation engines of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he took a lot of ideas from there and implemented, implemented them at FAIR. So how, how did it feel? Is FAIR the name of the internal research group? Is yeah, right? so FAIR is uh, now I think they call it fundamental AI research because the company is not called Facebook anymore, <laughs> but it used to just be Facebook AI research. And, and it was just a, just a separate research organization. So there okay. would be a different organization that was focused on like research to production and kind of the commercialization. And obviously research uh, is a big, big part of every engineering team as well in a company like that. But FAIR was mm -hmm. really standalone. So, so it had basically no connection to the company making money in any way. It was just really about having impact in the world. And the most is impactful that thing that, that came out of FAIR is actually PyTorch. Right? So it's not even about like publications or things like that. It's really about changing the world. And how, how did PyTorch come about or sort of what, what was sort of the beginnings of that? Uh, yes. And those were, uh, were the fun days actually, but when everything was still very fresh. Uh, so everybody <laughs> was working in Lua at the time. Uh, I don't know if you've ever used it. it. It's a pretty crazy language. It's like one index and it has all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but I, I think the people who had invested time in learning Lua and uh, Lua Torch, Torch 7, were very comfortable with it and, and felt that this was a bit of their advantage, right? their edge over others. So they, they were a bit reluctant, I think, to make it accessible to the masses in, in Python. Um, but Sumit, uh, Sumit Chintala was really pushing everyone saying like, okay, we need to get this into Python. It's, uh, it's really what's going to unleash this next revolution. And he was totally right. So I'm very happy that uh, people listened to him and not to some of the, the older folks who were saying Lua is fine. It was at first pushed as a project to help make like internal Facebook engineers more effective, or was it sort of initially designed to be sort of an open, you know, open source project that anybody could use? Yeah, the the idea was always to have it open. I think that Lua Torch uh, was also completely open, and um, yeah, this this is a part of Facebook's DNA. I think where uh, like React, uh, the web framework that they that they use is also completely open, and it's just a good way to. Make sure you have very high quality code and everybody's already familiar with it. So obviously Facebook or Meta now is, is reaping the benefits of everybody being super familiar with PyTorch. Um, mm -hmm. But the, yeah, the, the goal wasn't really to do that only internally. It's, it's different. It's an open culture. And what are the ways that PyTorch is used today? Like if you sort of just survey the landscape because it's so, you know, such a predominant tool uh, in, the, in the tool belt of builders. It's everywhere. I think is really, uh, yeah, I, I, I think 
people learn it now in like undergrad and it's really it's really everywhere the the other thing that that really is everywhere now is hugging face transformers if we can also talk about yeah. that but uh uh yeah there are just a, a couple of things that everybody learns now where back in the days when we were doing things in torch 7 we had to implement like the backward pass of every module that we implemented. Um, and then uh, we got autograd and suddenly we didn't have to do that anymore, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so slowly there's just this progress in the field where a lot of the, the complicated things that we were doing at the time are just slowly getting abstracted away. So I remember during my internships, I had to like implement LSTMs uh, from scratch, including the backward pass in Torch. And it was just a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. And now all of that is just like out of the box. You can do it very easily with N -N -N LSTM or like yeah. an end dot transformer or load model. So have you been surprised by some of the kind of applications people have been figuring out like that you could do with this that you sort of never imagined could be done when you first were building PyTorch? Yeah. I mean, so to be clear, I, I didn't have much to do with PyTorch, right? I was just one of the beta testers oh, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's just been amazing to see the, the rate of progress. It's really been astounding actually. And, um, so now obviously it, it's, it's gone very mainstream and, uh, I think uh, that's due to chat GPT, but it was already becoming more and more mainstream because things were just becoming easier and easier. So every, every standard engineer has some ML knowledge now, which probably wouldn't have been the case even five years ago. Um, so yeah, it's just very cool to see all of the stuff coming out and some of it is, is really a little bit too crazy for me, like all the auto GPT stuff and <laughs> that just doesn't work from a machine learning <laughs> perspective, but it's, it's very cool as a kind of demo. Really? So do you think that a lot of, I mean, I've been watching all these projects get launched. Like I, I was sharing a tweet the other day of this, uh, GPT engineer. Have you seen that? No, <laughs> it went, it went from like zero to over 30,000 GitHub stars in like, you know, the month that we've been traveling. So we were kind of like <laughs> came back in. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I think the auto GPT thing went to a hundred K stars. Like it ha yeah. has more stars now than hugging face transformers, which is just well, <laughs> nuts to me. Uh, so are these it, because they make really good demos, but are you, you're sort of skeptical of some of the actual utility or long-term yeah, viability? I think that that's one of the big. I, I don't know if it's a problem, but one of the big trends in the field right now is that there's a bit of a demo disease, I think. And, and mm -hmm. so everybody can build very cool demos very quickly, but actually productionizing this in, in a way where uh, you you uh, feel comfortable uh, uh, putting it out there and, and having it like interact with your customers or your employees, um, that's a whole different ballgame. And, right. and so that leap, I think, is where there's a lot of opportunity for companies to innovate. All right. I guess the, this term demo disease, uh, I'd not heard of, but I definitely know what you mean when you say it. Uh, and so I wonder, like, do you have a rubric or framework for how you think about separating things that are like really splashy demos from things that you think can be long term viable and useful? Like, is there is there a way to sort of separate the, you know, the wheat from the chaff or how do you think about that? Yeah, so I think it, in the end, it all boils down to evaluation. And that's really one of my uh, pet peeves as an AI researcher. Uh, I think we just need to be much more serious about evaluation. Um, and, and so a qualitative, like, oh, this looks like a cool demo. I can show this to my boss and I'm just going to like hand pick, like cherry pick the examples and, and he's going to give me a promotion. That, that's really very mm -hmm. different from we rigorously tested this new chatbot. We ensured that it has this uh, failure rate. Uh, it only hallucinates by this much. And if it makes a mistake, we can always fix it by doing this. Uh, so, so this much more rigorous approach is really what you need when you want to bring these models to enterprise settings. And is that eval done? Is that kind of a human feedback kind of eval or are there other kind of standard eval methods that you might use? Yeah, there are lots of different ways. So the, the classic way is just static test sets. So you just have some held out data that hopefully your language model hasn't seen, which in the case of GPT-4, there's a bunch of data con contamination, which makes it maybe look better than it is. Uh, but you would test on that and then you would have humans in the loop. You would basically run the full gamut of like a whole battery of tests to make sure that this system is actually what you need. Mm -hmm. And is that part of the goal or the mission of what you're doing with Contextual or is that sort of a, a separate a separate? It's a part of, of it, yeah. And so, so the, the basic thing we're building is a language model that will do better on those tests. Um, so, so we think that 
language models right now are first generation technology. They're really cool for demos. Uh, they're cool for some consumer facing applications, but they're not really there yet for enterprise applications. Uh, and that's because they hallucinate, they don't have attribution, they have compliance issues, you can't remove information. Uh, they're very slow and very expensive, and they have big data privacy issues where you have to send all of your data to somebody else's server, which if you're a company, you really don't want to do. So what we're building is a different kind of language model that overcomes all of these issues in one go. So you can try to solve the issues one by one, and some of the older AI companies are doing that, but we're saying, the architecture just has to be different. And if you have a better architecture and think about enterprises from first principles, then you can just solve all of these issues in one go with a better model. I see. Are there certain like key ideas within kind of how you think about the architecture that would be easy to sort of surface to maybe a, a more casual AI audience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the core idea that a lot of people are exploring actually is retrieval augmented generation. Um, and this is something I came up with uh, in 2020 at FAIR with my team. Uh, and the basic idea is just that you decouple the memory as much as possible from the generative capacity of a large language model. And when you do that, you can add information to the memory, you can remove information, revise it on the fly, mm. you have grounding in the things that you have in your memory. So the things you say, you always say them for a reason because you retrieve them. Uh, so you get the attribution as well, it hallucinates less. It's much more efficient. So retro uh, DeepMind has shown was 25 X. Um, uh, uh, so it was 25 times as fast as the equivalent language model uh, if it was just parametric. Mm -hmm. And then you get a very clean separation between the model plane and the data plane. So the data stays in the memory and the model is just reasoning on top of whatever co data comes out. Um, so that that ideas everywhere now. And so people are kind of hijacked the term. I came up with the, the, the term retrieve augmented generation rag, but mm -hmm. a lot of people are saying now that it's just a vector database plus a language model and that's rag. So that's sort of what I call poor man's rag or it's frozen <laughs> rag frag maybe is what we should call mm -hmm. it. Uh, because it, that's not op optimized in any way. And what you really want is to have a system that is trained end to end to do these tasks and then put constraints on what can happen where inside the system. And then you just get a better model. Uh, and so far we've been calling it the contextual language model. Mm -hmm. So, so you mentioned vector databases and it feels like a lot of the ecosystem is, you know, a, a lot of people playing in AI in various places are kind of converging on vector DBs as an interesting thing. Are you saying that vector DBs are not necessarily a kind of a complete solution or they might be part of it or the kind of a poor man's piece oh, they're, to they're achieve a very incomplete solution they just do one thing and a lot of them are actually very thin wrappers around an open source library out of fair from a couple of years ago called face mm -hmm. uh, facebook ai image similarity search mm -hmm. um and and so yeah thin wrappers where it's about how do we distribute the index which is an interesting problem and then maybe you want to add some traditional database capabilities on top. But what's happening is that a lot of these vector databases are finding out that they need to become a real database. And there are a couple of real databases who are trying to become vector databases. So mm. I don't, I don't, right. So like Postgres, uh, the, the database, they also have PG vector and things like that. So they're adding vector database capabilities to traditional databases. So I, I, I honestly don't really understand why vector databases are are really a, a thing in the long term. So it's just a way to do efficient retrieval. We could do that before with Elasticsearch and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so um, the, we'll see we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. All right. But it seems like a lot of the kind of excitement around AI are these like cool demos that people, you know, can sort of show up on a website and try something out. And uh, I think if I understand right from the contextual perspective, you're taking a very different approach, which is you want to build the tools that serve enterprises needs. Is that right? Yeah, we'll also still be doing demos. So there's nothing wrong <laughs> sure, with yeah. demos, to be clear. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I, I think it's much more, um, um, yeah, we, we want to focus on the enterprise because we think that that is where this technology is really going to have the biggest impact. So mm -hmm. it's going to change all of our lives, but it's especially going to change the way we do work. And if um, if we figure out how, how to do that the right way, then I think with Contextual, we have a shot of, of just really being an important player in helping people do better work 
and making more uh, out of the work that they're doing. Right. And so to to do this, it sounds like there's this new foundation model that you are building with a new set of architectural principles. And then do you sort of take that and go to a set of enterprises that you suspect may want to build LLM applications or how's because usually when there's enterprise involved, there's some sort of like customer development, discovery, design partnership. And I wonder, like, are there people who are already asking for these things or you kind of need to give enough of the, the basics of the technology built so that you can demonstrate kind of how it's different? Yeah, we're, we're very lucky, I think, in the, the moment in time where we are with this company. ChatGPT has basically shown every C-level exec in the world that they need to have this technology. Yep. And it has to work on their data with their requirements. And it currently, in many cases, doesn't. So that makes the pitch for us a lot easier because everybody already knows that they need this uh, uh, foundational technology, but they just need to have the right version of it. And that's what we're building. So we're actually finding that um, a, a lot of Fortune 500 companies are just reaching out to us and saying, like, can you please help us solve these problems? Um, so we're we're currently going through the motions with a few of these companies and, and trying to really be very careful with how we select the design partners because so we call them lighthouse customers they're going to mm -hmm. show us the way uh so it's, it's yeah. very important to choose the right lighthouses to focus on right what does a great lighthouse customer look like or what what are sort of the characteristics that you might want to select for to make sure that you've got somebody who because I'd imagine there, you know, there's so much excitement in this space that some people are just like, they want to try anything, but maybe to yeah. sort of make your design process work best, you, there'd be certain characteristics you'd want to filter for. Yeah. So you want to avoid the quick demos. You want to find real pain points, um, very clear ROI, ideally for, for investing in putting technology somewhere in an organization. Um, and then the the main criterion is actually just their ability to give you brutal honest feedback about all mm -hmm. the stuff you're doing wrong because you're going to be doing a lot right. of stuff wrong um so it's all about just having recurring meetings weekly where they destroy your product and then mm -hmm. uh, you make it better do they generally know what they want to do with it or are they just like tell me where it could apply to the org or how does sort of the the push and pull of those kinds of meetings work yeah, it really depends on the companies. Some companies are a lot further ahead and they really come to us saying, okay, this is the use case we want to focus on. And, and like, this is our evaluation set and this is what makes it good enough to be used in production. And others are like, okay, we hear this gener generative AI thing is like a big thing. Like, uh, can we, uh, what should we use it for? And, and you can really tell because uh, some cases people are just going, okay, customer support or very generic kind of bigger areas and others are really very specific on this one problem they want to solve. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage kind of the team? Cause it seems like there's the priorities of just building the foundational technology. And then there's all of these kind of customer development discussions and kind of design partnership lighthouse discussions. How do you, what does the team look like or how do you sort of balance all of the priorities? Yeah, it's a, always a tough balancing the priorities. There's never enough. Uh, time and people to do everything. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we grew from two to 12, uh, in a couple of months. Um, everybody's an engineer except for me, but I'm also kind of an engineer and our <laughs> head of ops. Um, uh, so I, they sometimes call me the head of front end jokingly because I had to implement the front end actually in Uber <laughs> rides back and forth between Palo Alto and San Francisco <laughs> to attend various VC dinners and things like that. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been fun, but uh, yeah, so we're very heavily focused just on building right now and actually trying to hold off customer discussions as much as we can, because we really want to build a, a good product and, and have a good model first. Right. And to build a new foundation model, is it similar to kind of maybe the public foundation models from kind of some of the processes, like you have to find a bunch of language scattered around the internet, maybe that's, you know, some of these open crawls, or maybe it's YouTube, you know, video, you know, audio tracks and transcripts, do you just sort of like multi-source and build a huge model with kind of this new architecture, but kind of similar types of crawling and uh, kind of input information? Yeah, it's pretty similar in terms of the source data, but then what you do with it is very different. Um, so, so the way you scale 
the training for these types of models because there's a separate component, retrieval component that's kind of integrated into the model that gives a very different set of engineering challenges. Mm -hmm. And so out of the 12 people on the, it's 12 total on the team today, yeah. um, is basically everybody working on just building that core foundational model system in the new architecture and then sort of there's not sort of a lot of division of of activities sort of all focused on that that single core right now yeah we're we're also doing a couple of demos we're coming out soon with a demo that shows some uh, multimodal capabilities um so so yeah it's a bit split up around more researchy projects and really building out the core infrastructure um because when a model is training then that that you can't really do anything. You can sort of babysit the, the loss curve. So there's other stuff you can do in between. Right. What does the timing and cost look like today to build a new model? Because my, my understanding was that some of the very early ones were relatively cheap, but that there's kind of this escalation, you know, as you look at GPT-3 and 3.5 and 4, that there's an escalation kind of, you know, the cost and the infrastructure and sort of just all the, you know, the team and data required to make that work and probably people's expectations or that what you're building looks something like that. So are you sort of aware of that cost curve and sort of it, does that impact kind of your thinking of prioritization, how you, how you manage the business? Yeah. Language models are very expensive. Um, and, and, um, so especially if you want to build the huge ones, uh, like some of the places you mentioned that, then you really, um, need a ton of capital. So in our case, we really want to be at the kind of optimal spot. So we, we are not interested right now in building artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. I think there are lots of folks working on that and I think it's really great. And for that, you really need a lot more scale. What we want to focus on is what we call artificial specialized intelligence. So we know that there are enterprises that have very narrow problems that they want to have solved. They don't need the system to know about Shakespeare and quantum mechanics. They just need mm -hmm. it to solve their company's problem. So those are the things we want to focus on. And there you need probably not as much skill, but you still need a lot of skill. So we have a ton of, uh, uh, you know, state of the art GPUs, uh, running in our own research cluster and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a, it's a bit more manageable than the huge amounts of money other places are spending. Got it. So are you able to, because of the domain, you're able to, are you selecting different size and different scales of what what content you need to input to sort of build up these kinds of models? Yeah, so there, there's an optimal trade-off between size and, and, and quality of the model. Um, and, and I think a lot of the, the smaller models are, are getting slowly commoditized over time. Uh, the mm -hmm. big frontier models will stay frontier models for a while, but they're usually too expensive to actually be used anywhere in production. So mm -hmm. it's like that middle part uh, that's, that's the most interesting part, I think, for companies like ours. Got it. I, I just recently heard, I don't know if this is like, uh, you know, an active topic of discussion, but I recently heard of this textbook is all you need. Is that, mm -hmm. is that kind of philosophically aligned with the direction you're going where you sort of picking high quality sources that are relevant to what the problems you're solving? Is that, is that kind of a consistent thing? Yeah, that's an industry, tr industry trend. Um, I, I, I think people should stop with those blah, blah, blah is all you need titles. Though. <laughs> right. really annoy me. But uh, it's, it's a, like, textbooks is not all you need. You need the language model to train on those textbooks, right? So right. Uh, it's more, I think the underlying observation is, is correct, though, that there's a trade-off between the, the sort of data quality and the data quantity. So if you have more noise in your data or data that isn't directly relevant to your downstream task, whatever you want to use the language model for, then you're going to need a lot more data. So the cleaner your data is, the less data you need, which means that you can more cheaply train a language model on it. Um, and that's what the, that paper really shows is that if you are very, very careful with selecting the data that you train on, then you can have a, a small model be uh, really pretty good. And is that how that's how you guys focus is you focus on specific data that you know is going to be high quality for your use cases? Yeah, I think everybody's doing that. Uh, it's so that yeah, there are cool. lots of ways to do that. Everybody's experimenting with trying to improve the the pre training data quality. Right. And you mentioned briefly the um, the compute uh, resources and the cluster that you use. And I've heard recently a lot of people complaining that it's even hard to get your hands on you know the Nvidia hardware that you need. Um, is that something that you've run up against, or are there sort of like 
covert ways are you like meeting people in back alleys and <laughs> <laughs> big bags of cash <laughs> yeah I, I think in our situation again we're fortunate with our timing and, and who we are um so it, it was uh very easy for us to get very good compute deals i think we have one of the best deals in in the field um and um but you yeah you have to really make a serious commitment to spending a lot of money on compute um so that that isn't really for everyone i think a lot of other ai companies are not in the business of building their own full models they're they're doing something smaller so they probably uh need a lot less compute and if you just need a little bit of compute lying around then it becomes a very different um yeah, yeah calculation so are you getting where you're actually managing the compute you have your own data centers and you're sort of like kind of from the metal up here yeah kind of so we, we have a supercomputer uh that or like a cluster that that we use for uh everything we do well that that sounds like a whole other complexity to the business does that turn out to you have somebody full time who's kind of like data center staff for that. Um, it's not that you know, complicated. We, we have someone who, who's sort of in charge of it. Um, and it's a it's a lot of work, yeah. But once it's set up, it, it's uh, not not that tricky. So it's more like how do you actually configure the system and how do you set up like the the job scheduler and things like that. Got it. And the um, the cost to do these things, we were talking about a little bit how that's sort of on this curve, and it sounds like there's some ways to contain the cost by focusing the use case. But I imagine that, I mean, I think you just did a, a big capital raise. Is that right? That's right. And how do you think about that being kind of allocated toward just the raw costs of kind of compute and training and infrastructure versus kind of the team? And, and how do you sort of think about the balance there? Yeah, so so most most of the money you raise as an AI startup building its own models goes directly to compute, uh, and I, I wish it wasn't like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's just an unfortunate reality. Um, so yeah, that that's really going to create your your IP, right? So you need to mm -hmm. invest in your IP, and you want to make sure that the people in your team have the resources they need to do their job. Yeah, is that something as you were going out to market? Is that something that generally? investors are already comfortable with those ideas or did you sort of have to help educate people on how what a kind of capital intensive uh, journey this was going to yeah, be yeah it depends on the investor some some investors i think are really uh, behind the curve uh some of them are catching up in, in weird ways where yeah uh, maybe they're overcorrecting a little bit on the other side <laughs> uh so yeah it depends but but the, like the what i would call sort of the the top investors they're very aware of of the reality here and and it's just a yeah a factor that that needs to be factored in here yeah how was the process of going out i guess you were probably building a bunch of new relationships as part of the fundraising process how was that going out and meeting a bunch of new people were there anything anything surprising about that process yeah it's been fun actually i i i really enjoyed it in a, in a way um so i i moved to uh palo alto during the pandemic or actually like one week before the pandemic started. So I wasn't really out there, even though I lived in Silicon Valley. Uh, so I didn't have a huge network of VCs or anything like that. So when, when we started thinking seriously about this company, I was just talking to the few friendly VCs I knew. Uh, and what I didn't know is that they all talk to each other. So before mm -hmm. I knew it, my inbox was just exploding with VCs saying like, Hey, we hear you're starting a company. Want to have a chat? Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I didn't really have to reach out to anybody, actually. It all came very, very naturally. That's great. And it sounds like maybe a lot of that, even without knowing what you were doing, it was kind of, they knew you by your reputation and your background and kind of some of the work you'd done before. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Which, which actually, we, we didn't get to talk that much about uh, your transition from Facebook to hugging face. But one of the things you did was you were you know, I think was it five years plus at Facebook and very mm -hmm. active with the research team there. And then if I understand right, you at, at hugging face, you were head of research. So can yes, you sir. tell us a little bit about sort of the transition from Facebook's research to hugging face? How did you decide to make that transition? What was the research culture like there? Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. So I, I started at, at Facebook as a postdoctoral researcher. I very quickly converted to a research scientist and then grew through the ranks. And when I left, I was one of the area leads, as we called it there, of uh, NLP and conversational AI. Um, so it really was time to just do something else. I was a bit fed up with all the politics, all the, the legal hurdles and all the, the slowness of a big corporation. So I was actually thinking of maybe already doing a startup then. 
but figured I wasn't quite ready yet and I wanted to get some more experience at a successful AI startup and see what it's like. And then Hugging Face obviously is one of the top choices there. It's really mm -hmm. an amazing company. Um, so I joined them um, as the head of research. So that was also a very different role from what I'd been previously doing at FAIR. Um, and yeah, it, it was a great experience. I, I learned a lot very quickly, um, worked with some amazing people that really have, have some uh, top tier researchers, Meg Mitchell and folks like that. So uh, it was amazing. And then what were the uh, after research that, goals I, similar to Facebook where you could kind of have an open purview or were you sort of trying to accomplish things that might be core to the commercial business or how does yeah, it's very different. Different? So as I said, fair really has no commercial focus whatsoever, mm -hmm. um, sometimes to their own detriment. <laughs> um, and, and with hugging face, it wasn't so much about commercialization, but it was much more about marketing and being out there. Um, so the turnaround time and the expectations on the, the turnaround on research were very short, sometimes probably a little bit too short, which makes, makes it very hard to do super impactful research because you would need to like show small incremental things. Mm -hmm. And w what's the overall kind of, you know, lay of the land at hugging face today is cause I, I'm familiar with some of the very early, I think it was originally a, was it like a virtual companion app? when it started yeah i and, think they started as a chatbot for teenagers and, and then yeah. um needed some transformers uh implemented the first uh pytorch pre-trained bird when bird came out um mm -hmm. and that became the transformers library around which they built this very successful company um and, and so and so bird it, itself was that that was kind of the the transition from the virtual companion to kind of more of an ml based uh, yeah so i think service. they've been pivoting every round uh, so initially it was a chatbot and then it was more around transformers. I don't know exactly. And then it became mm -hmm. being the, the GitHub for machine learning. So really the place where everybody stores their models and their data sets. Um, right. and, and I think that that's going pretty well for them. And by storing, uh, models and data sets there, does that mean that, is there the ability to kind of mix and match or like, if you have a good model, can you monetize it there? Or is that not part of how it works? That's not part of how it works now. I, I don't know exactly what their, their long-term plans are there. Um, but uh, I know they're very serious about the open source community and, and, uh, probably not trying to monetize it too aggressively. Uh, so it really is about building the community and, and then making sure that everybody, um, sees hugging face as the hub in this very large, vibrant ecosystem. I see. And you mentioned open source. It's a topic that I'm pretty passionate about in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, but you know, some, sometimes it does overlap with enterprise stuff and sometimes it doesn't. So I'm just curious, like within the context of contextual, if you will, um, is, is open source an important part of it, or is that not really core to what you're, you're doing right now? Yeah, I, I love open source. Um, and I, I think, yeah, we wouldn't be where we are now without the open source, right? So we mentioned things like PyTorch and, and so mm -hmm. Linux and things like that. Um, so, so for a company, it's always a bit tricky because especially in our case, when you have all of this core IP that you're developing, if you open source that you give it to everybody else. Um, so I think the approach we're taking is that we'll, um, open source a lot of our baselines and things like that to make sure that people see what's possible. But then if they want to have the real deal, then they would still, uh, come to us. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think open source in the language model space more generally is, uh, so right now we're at a very interesting moment. And, and a lot of that comes from, uh, fair open sourcing the llama model. And then there were all these like Vicuñas and Guanacos and all of the other alpacas, uh, mm -hmm. being built on top of that. Um, and, and without Facebook, the, the landscape would look very different already there, I think. Um, and, and the, those open source models are great, but they're sort of GPT three level, not GPT 3.5 and not even close to GPT four. So mm -hmm. there actually is still a pretty large gap. So this, the Google memo that you probably saw come by where, where yep. the person said that, uh, there is no moat and open AI and Google <laughs> have no moat. I, I thought that was one of the most ridiculous things I've read in a long time. Uh, and I, so in I, your I, view, I, there's a huge moat. That so Google so they have, have a huge moat, yeah, and and it's very naive uh, to think otherwise. And, and I I would encourage the open source community to not be so naive. So obviously, I, I want open source to win, right? I'm a big fan. Yeah. Um. Uh, and I've been been doing uh, everything I've been doing in my career has really been uh, out in the open. But um, 
if if we fool ourselves into believing that narrative, then then we're going to uh, not have a very good time. So right. so those places have massive moats from just their access to capital, from the compute they have, from the distribution they have, and mostly most importantly from the data. Right. So mm -hmm. they have these massive data flywheels that are very hard to reproduce in the open source community. So. What's going to happen, I think, in the long term is that there will be a pyramid where at the top of the pyramid, you have frontier models like your GPT-4s and things like that. At the bottom of the pyramid, you're going to have a very vibrant open source community. These models are going to get faster. They're going to run on commodity hardware. They're going to run on your phone. They're going to do cool stuff. But the middle part of that pyramid where you're really at sort of the, the trade-off between the compute needs, the quality needs, uh, and, and the data and compute requirements. Like that middle part of the pyramid is where uh, all the beautiful stuff is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that kind of state of the art at the top of the pyramid, is that going to just continue to like every few weeks, we're going to see something new that blows our minds or will it ever start to hit an asymptote where we'll see like decreased, uh, you know, kind of impressive leaps forward? Yeah, but we're not not close to the curve sloping off yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think in the next while, we're <laughs> going to see a lot of innovation and, and a lot of folks are just getting started right? like us and, and like, uh, so inflection only very recently came out with their first models. And uh, so there's all of these companies that are well funded that have really bright people doing new stuff. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of interesting developments in the next year or two years. And then after that, at some point, it's going to slope off um, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll see. Uh, who is standing at the end of that. So at the end of maybe two years, we're hitting an asymptotic slope of progress on some of the LLMs. And at that point, maybe would that give some of the more like groundswell kind of open source approaches an ability to sort of achieve similar yeah, results? So I think over over time, so as as we go down that, that, that road, the capital requirements are only going to get worse. Mm. So so if, if there is a meta, continuously open sourcing kind of semi state of the art models, then sure open source can keep up, but you really need like a benevolent uh, party like that. And, and if you don't have that, I, there's no way that just like a, the open source community without all the big money behind it is going to be able to build anything close to, to GPT-4 style models. Right. But I mean, given that we have, I guess at least, I don't know, I'd say at least three maybe credible contenders there with maybe Meta, Google, and OpenAI. And there's probably, you know, a, there's a whole other set of people going after this too. Um, you know, would they be put into a position where they have to give away more to, you know, they sort of have to commoditize their services, make them cheaper and give away more, maybe do more open source stuff just to sort of, you know, sort of bring the whole market into equilibrium or... How do you think about sort of the competitive aspects of those large players? Yeah, so Google and OpenAI would not do that probably because they're sort of the incumbents there and they, they have a very clear kind of channel for distribution as well uh, and mm -hmm. a huge customer base. So I think Meta is, is the one where it's maybe at this point in time less clear how they would monetize the technology and it's in their favor if they can keep leveling the playing field. Mm -hmm. um, but that's for now, right? So maybe in the not too distant future, they're going to have all kinds of chatbots in your Instagram and your WhatsApp and your Facebook Messenger. And you have all of these, some of them are just your friends and others are going to order your pizza and book your uh, flights and things like that. And maybe when they get to that point, they'll, they'll rethink their open source strategy. Right. So how far away do you think it is before we start seeing these like consumer use cases like you're describing? Because we've seen a lot of demos that are kind of slick, but then they're not necessarily super usable. And then sort of there's the explosion of plugins and the idea of, uh, you know, could we actually use the um, use LLMs to do things for us? Uh, but it's still a little bit of like, you know, you have to squint to see that future and we don't really have it yet. So is that weeks away or years away or how do we think? Yeah, about so the I, I think the first place where that disruption is going to happen is in the workplace, just like with mobile phones, where business mm -hmm. people had mobile phones before everybody else. And I think business people are going to have serious generative AI use cases before a lot of consumers for this kind of stuff specifically, right? So where it's kind of structured problems. Mm -hmm. But I, I would almost 
challenge your your point that we haven't seen anything beyond demo so so like character ai was but uh, that app was one of the most downloaded things in the apple store and so that there really are things like that going completely mainstream and i don't know if you've ever tried it but it's a really amazing product uh mm -hmm. where you just talk to einstein or whatever and you can learn some physics from him and stuff uh right, so, right. so yeah this is really it's already there. Cool. So you think we're we're basically already here and we're already seeing some of the early stuff. Uh, I guess is is it mostly kind of entertainment category or kind of it kind of these conversational things versus yeah, like so other entertainment is sort of an easier one because you have less of a requirement on the hallucination side, right? Mm -hmm. So it's okay if Einstein hallucinates as a character. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes right. if he screws up, you know that's fine. But in a business critical setting, you have a very different set of requirements. So that's why I, I, I keep emphasizing to people I talk to that there's really a difference between the consumer market and the enterprise market for AI. And for yeah. AI, you just need to like rethink from first principle. For for enterprises, you need to rethink from first principles what that would look like. Right. And in the enterprise, you mentioned sort of wanting to separate out the way kind of memory works as kind of a core part of the architecture. Um, you know, I wonder, can you tell a little bit about what lives inside a memory uh is it just uh, is it a bunch of text because you, you sort of mentioned how it can be used as a way i think to anchor hallucinations and mm -hmm. is there like like source material that you can discover by kind of investigating a memory or how, how do we think about a memory yeah so a memory it, it's just a neural representation so an embedding or or in our case multiple embeddings and then you what you want to um look for is not similarity which is what a vector database does but you want to look for relevance so when you ask a language model like uh, uh, say something in the style of shakespeare then you don't want it to go off and retrieve shakespeare's bio because that's mm. very useless useless right <laughs> what you want to find is examples of shakespeare's writing so that you can uh the you know uh, uh what is it what is the word uh, that you can adapt to it uh, mm -hmm. or transfer style transfer from it so um this kind of relevance, that's what you want to be able to uh, capture with your memory. So you want to encode the information in such a way that you can find the information that is relevant to the language model that is consuming those memories. Um, so one, uh, one way to think about it is uh, right now you have like Bing and, and things like that using, um, so you have a, a search engine that talks to a chatbot. And that mm -hmm. search engine right now is built for humans, not for chatbots, but you can actually right. build search engines specifically for consumption by language models. And if you do that, then you get much cleaner grounding. So is there a, a different architecture than kind of existing LLMs for building a better search? Is that kind of what you're hinting at? Yeah, exactly. So it's like one integrated system that does that better. And that's not the stuff that like Google is working on or OpenAI is working on right now? Um, they they might be, but uh, or so, just maybe yeah. in um, in R and D, it's not any of the products that we played with yet. Exactly, yeah. So that that's still like one one of the big frontier topics, I think, for a lot of folks. And, and so it's been great for me personally to see all the interest in retrieval augmented generation and things like having come up with it originally. Um, but yeah, there's there's still a lot of stuff to be done there to make this really work. Uh, right. So I can talk about it kind of freely here because it all. So it sounds easy, right? But it's actually <laughs> super hard to get this to work. Right. Do you think that, you know, just given sort of the, the scale and capital that like, you know, Google or an open AI have, you know, scale and talent, um, do you think that they are the likely winners of that kind of search or information retrieval kind of architecture that, that you're positing? Maybe. So, so I think they're really focused again on this AGI thing. And, and uh, so mostly open AI is focused on AGI and Anthropic and, and companies like that. And Google is very focused on not losing to them. Uh, mm -hmm. So they also have to play that game. And, and that, that creates an opportunity for companies like ours to focus more on the uh, enterprise market and do artificial specialized intelligence. So I, I think there are going to be lots of winners. Really, the whole world is going to change in the same way that the internet changed the world. Um, right. and, and so we are probably somewhere in, in something similar to a dot com bubble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but out of that are going to come massively successful companies that, that are really, uh, yeah, changing the world. And yep. there's also a lot of duds uh, coming out of that. Too. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> the process of innovation. So, so do you think that there's, um, 
uh, like new breakthrough technologies that are on the horizon that are sort of unproven yet, but that you're paying a lot of attention to waiting for kind of, you know, some evidence, maybe there's like a interesting paper, but we haven't actually seen an implementation that kind of indicates that it works or that, it, you know, kind of doesn't understand the problems better. Yeah, so so there are a bunch of topics that I, I've been interested in throughout my career. One of them is retrieval augmentation, which is now mm -hmm. going mainstream. And so I hope that some of the other things that I've been working on are also uh, going to become more mainstream. And I think it's actually very likely that that will happen. So one of them is multimodality, uh, which is really one of the, the big topics. Everybody knows that it's important. It doesn't actually work all that well. Everybody's pretending that you know you have these big multimodal models and they're great, and so they're obviously the future, but they don't actually work yet. Um, is it, is multimodality other... primarily about the output being multimodal, or a combination of the input and the output, or um, even just the input? It doesn't actually work yet. So we did this hateful memes challenge when we were at Fair, and and we wanted to see how good multimodal pre-training actually is. So if you if you really pre-train it in a way where it has access to the different modalities, so the text and the image, that mm -hmm. should work much better on on tasks like meme classification because memes are inherently multimodal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what we found is that the multimodal pre-training helps like one percent or something mm -hmm. on top of unimodal pre-training. So that it's just a very unsolved problem, and, and there's a lot of people working on it, but still, I, I don't think we're anywhere close to to solving that yet. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's really the obvious way forward because we're running out of data, text data. So what we can do is we can add all of these different modalities in there, train it all together and have a system that can conceptualize much better because it will understand the world in a, in a way that is much more similar to humans. Right? So if you mm -hmm. want to really understand the concept of a cat, you can go to Wikipedia and see that it's a small domesticated carnivorous mammal, <laughs> or you can watch lots of cat videos on YouTube. And now you really understand what a cat is to a human. Right, right. And so those, it sounds like those are the current architectures doing multimodal stuff only gets you like 1%, but are there like some new proposed architectures that people are exploring that sort of are unproven, but like, is there, are there like dozens of these that are sort of credible there, there's teams There's a lot working of work on? here. So, so, uh, Microsoft has a couple of very cool models that came out recently. GPT-4 is supposed to be multimodal. Uh, uh, mm. So that everybody's clearly going in this direction. Um, yeah. but, but it doesn't really work yet. So I think that's one of the, the big things that that's going to come in the next couple of years. And then the other thing is, um, multi-agent systems. So I, I think one way really to get language models and, and some people are scared by this idea, but one way to really get language models to learn very quickly is to have them learn from other language models. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so we were doing a bunch of work like five years ago in what we called emergent communication, where you have these systems talking to each other and learning communication protocols. And then the question was around, how do you ensure that they don't invent their own language, but that right. they keep using English and is grounded <laughs> somehow in reality for which you might need multimodality actually. And if you can, if you can make that happen, then, then you, uh, just have systems that can learn from each other. And so are you, when you have systems learning from each other, it sounds like one of the problems that you're pointing out can be solved is, in, you know, instead of letting them create their own languages, you can kind of anchor them in English language. Exactly. Yeah. But, so if you just have two language models talking to each other with no constraints, then why would they keep talking in English? Because they can just say the, the, the three times. And now you know that this means some complex thing, right? So they right. can invent their own idiolect. And this is one of the mm -hmm. big problems in emergent communication is how do you ground that communication so that it doesn't drift over time. I see. And so it sounds like, let's assume you've got them grounded in English only, uh, but it still seems like if you've got two, you know, two of these language models talking to each other, are they able to like invent or discover new knowledge or do they end up sort of regurgitating knowledge that they've, that are sort of part of their training or how, how is new knowledge is new knowledge created in that way? Yeah, so I, I think it, it depends on how you frame that question. Like you can frame that really from a sort of information theoretic, like mathematical perspective, then it's a bit less clear. Um, but I, I think yes. And, and, and so this is already happening even with a single language model where we have these chain of thought ideas, which are essentially like a language model just saying uh, and thinking a bit more. Mm -hmm. 
and then mm -hmm. getting to the right answer. So if you can then incorporate these chain of thought things from different language models and have them learn from each other so that they can, um, yeah, learn from the chains of thoughts of other language models, uh, then that's going to be a, a much better system overall. And is a chain of thought something around memory or like an attention window, or is that something else? It's like a data no, so, structure. Yeah, so chain of thought is really uh, like telling the language model, let's think step by step. And then it will just go like, okay, no, so, okay, we need to get to this answer, but like at first I need to know this. So, okay, the answer there is this. So now I need to know this, the answer there is that. So combining all of that information, now I know that the right answer is actually X and not Y. And so, so we currently it, have the ability to do that kind of chaining? Yeah, so that, that sort of chain in language models already have right now, and there's a lot of uh, cool stuff happening there where I mm -hmm. really, I would not have expected that to work, and somehow it does work. <laughs> uh, so that, that chain of thought, I think it's really, it's giving the system more time to think in a way, uh, and really yeah. rolling it out in a very similar way to how humans do it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so the other thing that humans do is we don't have all the information internally in our own brain. We talk to lots and lots of other humans and we listen to lots of podcasts of other humans and right. things like that so that we can learn from them. I see. And so machines would be taking knowledge that they have trained on and discussing with each other and they, would they be coming up with like new insights or it's just sort of like trading information that they already have stored from the way they were originally trained or I'm just trying to imagine I'm imagining the way like you and I may come together have a discussion and some new knowledge or insight might get recorded because of just sort of the interplay and is that yeah. exactly the same thing happening with language models or is there something different I, I wouldn't I would be very careful with the word exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's sort of similar yeah I, I I think that sort of information exchange especially if language models are trained on different data and exposed to different uh, yeah, different environments or, or different uh, sources of truth, that, then you can get interesting uh, information synthesis out of that. But that, that's a few years away, right? But uh, you just asked me, like, what are the interesting topics? Yeah. I think, like, yeah, retrieval augmentation, obviously, multimodality, and then multi-agent systems. Right. So if you're, like, hanging out with your friends, having a beer, are these, like, the topics that would be coming up? Or are these the things that people are excited about? Yeah, it depends on how many beers we've had. <laughs> <laughs> if it's quite a few beers, then it's more the, the latter topic, yeah. But uh, yeah, there, there are also just lots of uh, more pertinent questions, I, I think, um, especially if you're in the startup ecosystem around the, the power of the hyperscalers and, and how startups are going to be able to differentiate from these companies in the, in the long term. Is there even when you a, say hyperscaler? Is that yeah, hyperscaler? So just the Google's, Microsoft's, uh, Amazon's of the world. So they have mm -hmm. all the distribution. They have the compute. They they uh, have all these uh, great relationships with their customers. Mm -hmm. um, so you really need to to offer something different and special uh, to make it worth it for uh, for enterprises. And there, so there are playbooks there. So Databricks did it, and Snowflake did it, and all, all these companies uh, exist. Uh, even, even despite maybe the, the cloud providers being better set up to uh, to deliver these solutions. So it's possible, but you have to find the right model for doing that. And I think that's one of the, the big questions right now. And that's one of the reasons, I guess, that in contextual, you're going deep on enterprise use cases that maybe the hyperscalers are not going to, they're not going to be able to treat as deeply or not get as as deeply kind of integrated in serving those customer yeah. needs. And a lot of the, the, the big enterprises are multi-cloud. Uh, anyway, right? So they're not going to go with one cloud provider. So that also creates an opportunity. Right, right. Cool. Um, is there anything kind of in the, uh, I guess, a big part of what I see in the contextual um, website talks about the privacy awareness? And I wonder, like, is that a core part of the new architecture? Is that something that is just a default that's needed by every enterprise. And so it kind of became part of your design goals or how do you think about sort of the privacy piece of what you're doing? Yeah, that's really one of the, the core requirements for a lot of enterprises. And, and I think one of the big problems with parametric language models where you compress all of that information into one single language model and you don't have this decoupling that we have um, is that you get very confused about the privacy of the data. Uh, so the language model can leak all kinds of data. It can be trained on, on weird data that you don't really want it to be trained on. Um, you have to go off and send your data to some external language model and you just have to send it as like plain text. There's no way really around that. So 
if you actually separate out the data plane and the model plane in a very clean way and, and you already do a bunch of processing inside the data plane before it even gets to the model, um, then, you, then you have much better data privacy guarantees. So, that, so you're kind of creating like a, si a silo per enterprise, is that right? Yeah. Like there's some yeah, so, common so, shared data? Exactly. So there are different ways to package this. Uh, and and uh, so one way is to really just do it fully single tenant for one single enterprise. And the other way to do it is to have uh, different memories. So every uh, company has its own memory, its own retrieval engine, uh, but then that gets sent to a, a multi-tenant language model, but in a, in a way where you have very good access controls and you remove PII beforehand and, and things like that. All right. And then do those run in your data center or do would enterprises want that on-premises in some way or? So some of them want it on-prem. Uh, for a startup, on-prem is very dangerous because it's really a time sink. Uh, so mm -hmm. so uh, ideally, you at least have some some of your processing happening in your data center. Uh, but it, it really depends on the customer and where, where it's going like, They would run into those same challenges, even getting the right hardware, probably other requirements and building out their data centers. Yeah. To support so, so, yeah, it's really a trade-off. Some companies are very tech forward. They have their own like compute cluster. They know how to handle this stuff. They have a bunch of rockstar engineers who can do it. And other companies uh, don't have that, And but they do want to have generative AI. Uh, so how are you going to get that to work? Right, right. Cool. And it sounds like, I mean, so far you've got your capital raised, you've got a good team set, you've got some lighthouse customers and partners, like what's, what are sort of your asks for the world or what are the things that you, you are looking for these days? Are you still, I think you've got a few roles on the website. I saw, are you still hiring for a few key roles? We're always hiring exceptional people. Uh, and we will never stop doing that. So, uh, yeah, it, if anyone uh, is exceptional, <laughs> then <laughs> I would love to talk to them. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of it is so, so it's on the product side, but it's also on the more researchy side and also just pure engineering, like really scaling these systems comes with super interesting engineering challenges. Um, and, and yeah, we're always looking for, for good people there. So that's definitely one thing. And, and then the other thing we're also always looking for is. Uh, folks who want to be our lighthouses and steer us in the right direction. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're always interested in, in learning more about the problems that, that folks have and, and seeing how we can help solve them. And just to make sure, because we talked a little bit about what makes a good lighthouse uh, partner before, but just, just to really sort of distill it, uh, if you were sort of making the call out to like, what would a great lighthouse partner look like, or maybe somebody who's seeing this or listening to this, um, you know, is one of these people or might know of one, what, what would be the kinds of characteristics that they should be looking for to think, oh, let's, let's get in touch with contextual. Cause we think they might, they might be a good solution. Um, so ideally they're tech forward. They have a very clear problem. They have a very clear way of measuring success on the problem and they are willing to give us lots of very direct feedback. Mm -hmm. And do they, do you think in, would they usually already have an in-house ML team or they wouldn't, you'd be sort of talking to maybe the CIO of somebody who doesn't have an ML team and wants to sort of lean on you for that kind of expertise and, and talent? Yeah, that's also interesting. Yeah. Um, so w one of our goals is really to make this as easy as possible for an enterprise. So uh, ideally the CIO uh, themselves can just uh, set up the language model and uh, play with it. Nice. That's cool. And on the uh, hiring people, you mentioned the, um, uh, you know, just exceptional people, uh, people who built you know, maybe scaled systems. Do you think usually people already have experience building ML systems like this, or are there like enough new problems that just like talented generalists who want to get their first, you know, maybe they've scaled web systems, but not ML systems. Would that be like an appropriate background for this kind of role? It could be. Yeah. It really depends on the specifics. Uh, so, so yeah, engineering problems very often have very similar properties. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I think it's a very transferable skill. Um, but at the same time, yeah, machine learning comes with its own unique set of, of, uh, of quirks, uh, around like how GPUs work and things like that. So, uh, some expertise there is useful, but it's not required. Mm -hmm. And do you guys, I know you're in Palo Alto, does the company operate kind of fully in person out of Palo Alto or do you have like a remote culture or sort of a hybrid? 
Yeah, so we we try to have an in office culture as much as possible. Uh, so uh, our team is in the Bay Area. Uh, a bunch of us are in the city or in the South South Bay or in the East Bay. So um, uh, sometimes they work from home, but we try to really have everyone come into the the office as much as as, as they can. Um, and we uh, this week actually moved into our new office, so we're in Mountain View. Uh, oh, now. great! Is that one of those lucky offices that uh, gave birth to Google or? <laughs> no. <laughs> and yeah, so it's on the and it's on the corner of Palo Alto and Mountain View. Um, oh, great! But, uh, yeah, so probably close to a bunch of good restaurants and stuff. Yeah, cool. And you're you're down south too, right? You said you live in Palo Alto still. Yeah, yeah, okay. I still live here. Yeah, so, so we see you up nice. in the city every once in a while. Yeah, just on, uh, so yeah, then I I take the Uber up to the city and I I code in the Uber ride. Uh, back uh, and forth uh right. <laughs> that's what i used to be doing uh, <laughs> but so yeah from here uh, palo alto to mountain view is nice for me because as a dutchman it's very important that i can cycle to work right oh yeah are, are you a big cyclist outside of transportation or uh -huh. mostly yeah. i love going out in the mountains here and okay stuff. so you go out to like pescadero and san yeah. gregorio old la honda exactly. all that stuff old la honda yeah unfortunately What's your old la honda time i uh, uh, i think it's uh 21. nice nice you got that on strava uh, it's not on Strava, no. <laughs> <laughs> These are the hard hitting questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, I mean, there's a big culture of, of cycling in the Bay area. I, mm -hmm. I actually used to live in Menlo myself and, and, you know, that was kind of my backyard. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, many years ago, but, um, you know, do you, as a team, do you guys get together and, and do you take the team on rides at all? Or are people into that? Not yet. We've been talking about it. Yeah. But then, so yeah, all the yeah. Honda is if you, if you're not trained is not, not the easiest, right? So maybe we'll do something a bit yeah, easier. Just start them on page mail or something. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> That's much better. <laughs> <laughs> something easy to get started. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, well, this has been fun to to get together. Thanks for thanks for coming by and sharing everything about uh, about you and what you're building, kind of history. Anything else that we should be uh, thinking about, or or things that uh, we didn't talk about that we should? Um, yeah. I'm, 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 uh, thanks for having me, first of all. But um, um, I don't know. I, I, what I always tell people is, it's really early in the game. Uh, it's like the first inning is just barely finished. Uh, this stuff is clearly going to change the world. We're all figuring out how exactly that's going to happen. Um, and, and so, yeah, the exciting times ahead of us. Yeah. I always tell people um, to not focus career decisions on a specific problem, but focus career choices on the people that they want to work with, people they think they can learn from, people they think uh, you know, well connected to a bunch of high quality information and stuff. And so I think you're clearly, you know, you've been in the game for a long time. You've been at a bunch of the places doing research and getting those networks built. So you sort of exposed to all the, the, the best kind of people and thinking and sort of have your own frontier of, uh, of thinking yeah. and knowledge. So, yeah. So my, um, my goal throughout my career, and I think throughout my life, uh, I will have the same goal of just maximizing learning. So the, if I have two, two paths, I can go down, I will choose the one that gives me the most learning. Yep. It's great philosophy. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much.